a year ago, on June 15th, 2022, my best friend Seamus Young passed away, suddenly, but not entirely unexpectedly. I'm making this tribute video to commemorate his life and to hopefully buttress the healing that only time can truly provide. Seamus Young was a, was a unique character. As a denizen of the internet, he was always online. He was always available for people. As a C-list celebrity, he was a person who could be reached without feeling like you were intruding too much on uh, someone, someone's super valuable time, but at the same time was someone who could provide the sense of being seen and being validated in your thoughts or uh, your opinions that was out of reach for most of the, the A-list and B-list celebrities. I can't even claim to be that level tier celebrity. I'm just some guy on the internet who happened over the years to befriend Seamus, and uh, his legacy is not going to be boosted in any way by this video, I, I don't imagine. Um, his family, his children, are are continuing to maintain his website and keep his, uh, his website up, which is basically his life's work, and... I think that's really the best testament to his his legacy and his his achievements, his his website and his his blog. He poured his whole life into that project, and uh, and now that his life has ended, the website is still there for people to view. And uh, I really encourage you to go and and browse, read, and enjoy the things that Seamus enjoyed as well. I didn't know him then, uh, I wasn't even born, but at the time uh, when he was a child, Seamus Young was fascinated by technology. He basically taught himself how to program, taught himself how to read, and, uh, and really wanted to engage with these amazing tools that you're all using now to watch this video. He was driven to be educated, not by others, but by himself. Driven to learn things. And if others wanted to help him, that was great, but he was he was kind of captured by his own interests, by his own desire to, to learn. And if something wasn't interesting to him, no amount of coercion or conviction on the part of others would change his mind. Seamus was passionate about learning by doing. He learned to write by writing. He learned to program games by programming games. He was a tireless autodidact. He was always teaching himself things. He was always looking into stuff and figuring out how it worked and processing it and trying to trying to boil it down to its essence. He loved to share what he learned and and he had a tireless desire to teach others, but as a result he also had almost no patience for instructional incompetence or obfuscation. Uh, he hated object-oriented programming because it it was always hiding things away inside containers and he wanted to see what was in there and, and see how things worked. Uh, he was very resistant to using Blender because it wasn't interested in teaching people. It was a, a software for experts and beginners and people who were just new to the, the discipline weren't really welcome. Uh, he had so many skills that were all tied together. And it's made it really difficult to make this video because how do you talk about what he was good at. Well, he was good at so many things. He was good at, at so many different aspects of this whole internet culture thing. He wrote books. He wrote his blog. He made videos. He made video games. He critiqued video games. Uh, I was drawn personally to Seamus Young's procedural generation and programming in context of 3D visuals and having the computer author levels and scenes and settings 
And I hardly even touch here on his music, his composition, and his love of setting and tone. He even went to a few conventions, despite being a totally incapacitated <laughs> introvert and and almost an agoraphobe. So it, it was... Uh, it's been hard to kind of sum this all up, but I'm doing my best. In all of his writing, and especially in his video game critique, Seamus was a voice of reason and insight. He was always trying to get people to stop freaking out and start thinking, to stop uh, fighting and start dialoguing. He was a, a person who believed deeply that things could and should be understood, not just take a side and pick the one that pays you the most money or, or that you like best. Because he loved computers and, and video games so much, he was deeply invested in games being the best they could be, but that never led him to sensationalize or, or blow things out of proportion, except occasionally for humor. And he did have a beautiful humorous streak. He knew right at the edge where you could say something that was a little bit more true than was honest, but also was a little bit less true than might be necessary. Seamus Young was a prolific writer. He ended up writing about 200,000 words on his blog every year for 16 years. And that doesn't include his books and uh, the various pieces he did for The Escapist and the writing he did for his videos and the podcast that he did with the spoiler warning crew as well as spoiler warning. So just a tremendous amount of output, a tremendous amount of work, and uh, and not just schlock, but high quality stuff. And like I said at the beginning, this is all available on his website, on his blog, 20 Sided Tale, and uh, I really encourage you to go look at it, see what Seamus wrote himself, uh, browse some of his old articles, browse some of the things that he thought were his best work, and uh, and really appreciate what he gave to all of us. Very likely his most famous work is his DM of the Rings series, where he took screenshots from the Lord of the Rings movies and combined them with his own video or his own comic book captioning to make a comic book story that tells the tale of the Lord of the Rings as if it were being GM'd by a not so great GM and played by a group of not so great role players. And uh, he hits on so many tropes from role playing. And, and Dungeons and & Dragons, uh, and video games too, to a certain degree, that poked fun at the Lord of the Rings story, and poked fun at, at nerd culture, but also came from a place of deep appreciation of both. So that's what people liked, and what drew many readers to his site, but I think Seamus would say that his writing in the book form would be his crowning achievement for authorship. He wrote Free Radical, a fan fiction story that was serialized and released on his blog in real time and incorporated feedback, which is something else that he was so good at, was reading people's comments, understanding what they meant, understanding where they were coming from, and then incorporating their ideas into his ongoing work. Something that I see very rarely these days in, in other creative authors and any creative types of any kind. He wrote his own autobiography, of course, uh, called How I Learned, and it's also on the blog as the autobiography, available for free. He then wrote The Witch Watch, which is a kind of fantasy magic mixed with computer programming novel that romps all over the place and is probably one of his most atmospheric works that really dives into the feeling of Victorian England while not getting too bogged down in the details or in politics, which he always shunned. He worked on a science fiction story called Fall from the Sky, which I'll talk about a little later. And then The Other Kind of Life, his final fiction. And then his final work, although again it was from the blog, was Mass Effect, a Mass Effect retrospective 
hundreds of thousands of words and a really deep dive into a video game that so many people loved, so many people hated, was controversial in so many ways, and made him think endlessly. Before any of that, though, Seamus' first post on his blog was a posting of the role-playing series that he DM'd. He wrote the whole thing himself. He ran the whole campaign for his friends and family. And if anything could sum up Seamus, I think it would be that he wanted to be the dungeon master for the internet. He always wanted things to make sense. He never wanted to railroad anyone into things they didn't want to do, or engaging with stuff that they didn't care about, or that made them uncomfortable. He was well-rounded and competent in all the aspects that you'd need. He was capable. He was affable. He was easy to get along with, but would push back when you were doing something that didn't make sense. He had a sense for design and, and puzzles and storytelling that all meshed together beautifully with his sense of immediate response, of his, his dialogue with his players and his audience. I would say that I wish that he had done more role-playing games, but really, his work was a campaign. He was running his blog, incorporating all of us into this real story, this real thing that was happening. All the real events in the world, he was trying to tie them together into something that made sense, something that could be played with. Seamus had a unique confluence of skills. His technical abilities, his writing abilities, his affable interaction with his fan base, and his ability to understandably present even technical information in a way that even newcomers could comprehend. Seamus' gaming abilities and, and authorship and programming all played together into his game's critique. He was a, a tireless fanatic about understanding technology and understanding why things were done the way they were. Not just why can't we have things better, but why don't we have things better? What plays into how things are made and what we can do about it? His programming background included a broad range, again, from back-end and 3D graphics support all the way to the front-end and user interface. He knew the models inside and out, even if he didn't know all the details of the tech. He understood how it all fit together. Because he knew the technology so well, he was always baffled at how CEOs could be so incompetent and, and so ineffective, even at providing profit, which they were ostensibly seeking, to their companies. He would often write articles about, if I was an effective evil CEO who was greedy for profit, here's what I would do. And often his suggestions were not that awful. They were sensible, profound insights into how the industry could be effectively leveraged to draw profit from their audience. He wasn't a businessman, and he was never good with money. But he did understand how one could achieve the goals that it seemed people were aiming for and do it in a very entertaining way. But even as he framed it as an evil CEO, he never vilified anyone. And he went out of his way, far out of his way, to not present people in an evil Saturday morning cartoon, black and white way, but in a humanizing way that understood that their motivations were the same as his. They wanted a good life, and maybe they'd made some bad choices, so had he, but they could be understood in why they'd made them and could be encouraged to make better ones. His insistence on level-headedness and avoiding divisiveness extended into the politics realm, which he famously and consistently refused to discuss on his blog. He would not allow partisan politics into that space. It was just too divisive. It was too hard to talk about. And occasionally people would have some discussions, some heated discussions even. And more often than not, the conversation would end with Seamus saying, I appreciate all your thoughts, but this is now closed. I'm sorry we can't discuss this here. Even though he had very strong political views that we even shared occasionally with each other in private, 
he was adamant that the unity of the community was primary over the message and the political expediency of the day. In a world where so many people got drawn into weighing in on one side or the other of important and, frankly, life-changing policies, politicians, and cultural movements, Seamus had a rare approach of saying, it's fine, but do it somewhere else. This is not the place. And I know I and many of his readers deeply appreciated that haven from the incredibly divided and incredibly heated and often vitriolic political discussions that took place seemingly everywhere else. Part of the reason Seamus could never get into political moderation was that he was an incredible introvert, totally incapable of broad-scale public interactions. He could talk with people one-on-one just fine, but speaking to a crowd, public speaking, and even going out was really beyond him. It drained him entirely. Once he went to PAX East, and the experience was so traumatic he never even considered doing it again. But despite all this, he always made time for his audience. The space provided by the internet and by that comment section where he could, at his leisure, interact with people seemed to allow him to let his jubilant and friendly personality shine forth. And just because he wouldn't engage with political narratives didn't mean that he didn't understand narratives entirely. He was consistently and tirelessly looking out for flaws in stories and plot holes, structural problems that could have been avoided in the writing stage, or concepts that fit with one game but not with another, things that were shoehorned in or appeared to have been out of place, and ways to fix them in ways that wouldn't break the budget, destroy the tech, or turn the game into something that it wasn't trying to be. He was always reasonable, and though he wanted a good story, he wanted it to make sense, not only in a story sense, but in a technical, a financial, and a gameplay sense as well. As a game developer, he was never successful, in the same fashion that he was never successful as a blogger or an author. He made ends meet, and that was enough for him. But he did publish a video game, which he wrote from the ground up, from scratch. The entire engine, all the gameplay, all the back end, all the interface. He wrote the whole thing. Good Robot is still playable today, it's still available on Steam, and it stands as a testament to his tenacity in pursuing the passion which made him a unique character. I was never able to beat the game myself, but I did beat it with my wife, her controlling the mouse and shooting the enemies, and I using the keyboard and flying around. It was never intended to be played that way. But like many of the things that Seamus worked on, the intent wasn't so much the important thing as the outcome. Seamus never intended to build a community. He just wanted to share his passion for role-playing and dungeon mastering of anime for a while and video game narratives. One of the first comments I wrote on his blog was a response to someone asking, well, how would you do this or that weather system simulation? And I responded saying, you're thinking about it all wrong. You should build the system from the top fractaling outward instead of trying to build it from the bottom with all these separate leaf nodes and systems interacting. And Seamus responded something along the lines of, that's exactly right. And I was touched. I felt seen. I, I knew that he had been paying attention to the narrative, to the discussion, to what he had said in the original post and what people were thinking about it. And my investment was responded back with affirmation. And that's something that many of the people on his blog never really got anywhere else. Just acknowledging that their thoughts were validated, their their ideas were, were real, and that we were all on the same page together. Some years later, when Seamus released Fall from the Sky, his unfinished novel, about 40 or 50,000 words, I took it upon myself 
to finish it. And I'd never written a, a long form book before. I'd written several short stories, but this is something that I felt that I could take on, especially since Seamus seems so interested in engaging with people and and being part of the community and the community being part of his work. But I never was able to attract his attention to work with me on the project. He had, was done with it, and that was that. He had to follow his own directives, his own passion, his own fascination, his own interests. I worked on the book for several years and did finish it and published it online. And although I eventually got Seamus to respond to my persistent inquiries of what he thought and was it any good and was it what he had in mind, his response was underwhelming that he skimmed over it and it was nothing like what he had been imagining and that there was nothing wrong with that, but he felt that he couldn't comment on it because he just had no frame of reference for whether or not it was any good or not. It seemed strange to me for someone who was so committed to trying to improve the stories of pop culture and video games especially, that one of his own fans works based on one of his own pieces of fiction would elicit no response whatsoever. He did post on his blog that I had made the completion novel and posted a link to it, but his lack of engagement with that significant effort on my part always stung and still does. But he wasn't going to engage half-heartedly. He wasn't going to give me something and kind of toss me a bone. He was either going to do something with his whole heart, with his whole being, with his whole self, or he was going to let it go and let someone else handle it. And I appreciated his honesty that he couldn't give me anything because there was nothing left for him in that respect to give. I drifted away from the site during the spoiler warning phase. I didn't mesh with the spoiler warning crew's atmosphere and, and feel. They were interested in different things than I was. They were trying to do something else, and, and that was fine. But I did feel somewhat saddened that it seemed that Seamus was becoming friends of the spoiler warning instead of friends of the comment section, where we were all there providing what? Attention? Was that all it really was? Just Seamus and his comments, his commenters, attending to one another? I attempted to help with the production of Good Robot by making some fan trailers or videos, animations of the Good Robot doing things and kind of trying to be helpful, provide something, contribute something. But they too were met with indifference by Seamus and outright rejection by some of his other colleagues. Eventually, the spoiler warning crew and Seamus parted ways, and I started to engage with the blog again. Then, a couple years later, I visited Seamus in person. At the encouragement of my wife, kind of reached out and said, hey, I'd like to get together, I'd like to see you. And he strangely agreed, so we met, had a lovely time. And that was the first and last time that I ever saw him in person. We started doing the diecast, his podcast, together. And had a lovely time. I started thinking of all the things that I would tell him every week. Whenever I'd play a video game, I'd be thinking, what would be something interesting that Seamus would say about this? Or something interesting that I could tell him about it? When I was working on 3D graphics, or, or even out driving... I'd be thinking about his car analogies and all the things that I could bring into the next episode to talk with him. Despite our friendly interactions on the blog and on the podcast, Seamus was all business outside of those elements that were published. I never really felt like we were friends. We were just kind of associates working together, but... It seemed that he always kept his distance. Little did I know that those four and a half years, 
I was forming a relationship that would be one of the best friendships of my life. And uh, when it ended, I was informed by his wife and by my wife that we were, in fact, best friends. And that still stings. I never felt like I was a good friend to him or to any of my friends. I'd, I always felt sorry for people that I was the best friend that they had. But we were all that we had for each other, I suppose. And I'm glad I could have been here for him there at the end. Perhaps you feel the same way, that Seamus was the friend that you needed, but you never really felt like he knew who you were. Or you wish that you could have met him and deepened the relationship somehow, made it personal. And as someone, one of the very few of the internet fans who did meet him in person, you don't have to feel that way. We were all in the same boat. He wasn't giving me anything special that he didn't give all of you. He really was there in the comment section. He really was there reading every single comment. He really was there putting all his thoughts on his blog, on his podcast. He wasn't squirreling things away. He wasn't giving preferential treatment to anyone. Seamus was genuinely your friend too. And if you'd like to honor that friendship, Again, go visit his blog. Go see the things that he wrote. Go read them for yourself. They're still all there. Go watch some of his old videos. Listen to his voice again on the podcast. Seamus Young had an ongoing passion for curiosity, innovation, learning, and knowledge. And it's only right for those of us that remember him fondly that we should carry on that legacy. For more, and in fact, all the information about Seamus, visit SeamusYoung.com slash 20-sided tale. Many of us are still there in the comments. There's still new content going up. I hope to see you there.